great that you're here. Okay, today what I want to do is tell you about one project that my research team has been working on for about the past four years on self-control, health, wealth, and public safety. Now, overall, our research aims to find ways to prepare today's children for tomorrow. And there are several reasons why we think this preparation of today's children is important. Uh, first, we know, we learn from demographers that uh, because of the falling birth, weight, world, birth rate worldwide, uh, children are going to become increasingly rare and increasingly valuable. At the same time, there are more and more of us old people. I just had my 60th birthday on Monday, so I'm 60 years and four days, and now I'm counting myself among the old people. So, <laughs> uh, trying to get used to the idea. Um, so each, that means that each young worker will support more and more old people, and that's called the support ratio. I'll tell you a bit more about it in a moment. Um, and then the last fact we learned from demographers is about life expectancy. It's growing longer and longer, and this re means that today's children will have to prepare um, to support us in our old age, but also to prepare for a longer old age for themselves. I'll tell you about the support ratio. What you see here is the classic age pyramid. Uh, the blue part shows for males, the pink part for females. The length of the rows represents the size of the population in each age group. At the bottom of the slide, you see how many children there are. At the top, how many old people. And in the middle, it shows you how many people are adult workers. Um, these are data from Brazil, which I'm showing you as an example, because Brazil makes such a beautiful age pyramid at the moment. You see that in the year 2000, most of the Brazilian population were young people. In 2020, we see those children moving up the pyramid and becoming adult workers. And by 2050, most of Brazil's population will be old people. And now I show you the same population pyramid for Western Europe, including the Netherlands. And what you see immediately is that this has already happened to us. We're well ahead of Brazil. Every child is already more and more valuable today. So here, I'll show you an outline of the lecture so you can follow along to see how the lecture is progressing. And this is so that if you become terribly bored, you can see it will not take very much longer. And so you can count the time coming until the cocktail reception. And so what I want to do first is show you some evidence from the Dunedin study that childhood self-control predicts success and failure in adult life above and beyond intelligence and family wealth. Now, this is important because everyone already knows that success in life follows from high intelligence and from good family socioeconomic resources. You heard yesterday afternoon uh, in one of the major se sessions about the importance of socioeconomic status for success in life. But it's already also known that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to eliminate the wide differences between people on their IQs and their social class of origin. Um, in contrast, self-control skills are thought to be something that might be teachable. Now, at this point, I have to also pause and tell you that one reason we did this research uh, is because of um, colleagues who were professors of economics challenged me to study self-control. They said, you've got data on self-control in the Dunedin study. Why don't you write them up? Why don't you see if childhood self-control predicts adult outcomes? And I said, I've spent my whole career studying intelligence and neuropsychological functions and executive function. I know that intelligence is where it's at, and if you control for intelligence, self-control will become unimportant. So they didn't believe me, these pesky economists, uh, and we made a $100 wager. I wagered that IQ would be the most important variable in the data set. They wagered on self-control, and thus I did the work we'll tell you about tonight. So today, there's a lot of new scientific interest in self-control by researchers and policymakers, uh, and that's because it's thought to be more necessary now than ever before in world history. Uh, historians are telling us 
that we need our self-control to avoid becoming obese because we live for the first time in human his history in an era of easy food availability. We need it to maintain our fitness because for the first time in human history, our jobs are sedentary. We need our willpower to sustain our marriages because it's so easy to get a divorce today. We need our self-discipline to prevent addiction because illicit and addictive substances are easily accessible all around us and not merely in Amsterdam. Uh, we needed to resist spending. If you go down to the big shopping district, you'll see what I mean. But we live in an era of sophisticated marketing, more so than ever before. And now we have to, on top of all this depressing uh, stuff, we have to save for our, old, own, uh, our own old age, because now we live in an era without any guaranteed pensions. <coughs> So self-control is currently under intense study by many of the behavioral sciences. If you visited the posters out here today, you would see many titles having to do with self-control. So many of the behavioral sciences are using different concepts and different measurement approaches. For example, personality psychologists study self-control, social psychologists, child psychologists, even economists. Uh, neurosciences study uh, executive functions. Psychiatry tends to focus in on inattention, hyperactivity disorder, and even management science in business schools is studying self-discipline in the service of leadership. So it's a very widely studied um, construct in the, the behavioral sciences today. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to the Dunedin study, uh, which is where uh, we've done our work. So we need to leave uh, the Netherlands and travel to New Zealand. And note that New Zealand, as opposed to Old Zealand, uh, which is where we sit today, uh, New Zealand was um, first described by a Dutch explorer, Abel Tasman. So that's why we have uh, the two names uh, uh, opposite to each other. So this is the, the design of the Dunedin study. Uh, we began by studying all the babies born in one city in one year, in the 1972-1973, and that there were 1,037 of them who agreed, were eligible and agreed to take part. Uh, the cohort represents the full, full variation in the population, all walks of life, and all ability levels. If you look down the left-hand side of the slide, what you see is that each age that the study members have come into our research unit, uh, into the clinic, for a full day of assessment. Um, and if you look down to the bottom right-hand part of the side, you see an important detail, that the last time we saw them, when they were 38 years old, in 2012, 95% of the original birth cohort still took part. This means that um, those who have been unsuccessful in life have not dropped out of the study along the way. So the findings that I'll show you still represent the whole population of New Zealand South Island. We measured each child's self-control during the first decade of life by assessing the sorts of qualities that you see here. So impulsive, impulsive uh, acts without thinking, can't wait his or her turn, has a low frustration tolerance, dislikes effortful tasks, fleeting attention, lacks persistence, goes for the risky thing, requires constant attention and motivation from an adult. So that's an example of the kinds of uh, items and ratings that were collected by the team in New Zealand uh, during the first decade of life. Um, now, um, of course, every child shows poor self-control at some point. Uh, we all know about the terrible twos. Small children haven't got that much self-control, and that's developmentally typical. So for the research that we're doing now, we wanted to define self-control uh, in terms of its um, persistence and pervasiveness. So we looked to see, um, made a composite of ratings um, that were collected by the Dunedin team. Um, so we ask if the child's style of self-control uh, had persisted across ages 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 uh, years, so all those assessments. And we asked that it was agreed upon by multiple reporters. So we had staff observations of the child's self-control during the day spent at the clinic. 
We had parents reports on repeated parent checklists at each of those ages. Four different teachers reports at age five, seven, nine, and 11. And then when the children were 11 years old, we also interviewed them about their own self-control once they were old enough to reflect on that. Uh, so when I speak of poor self-control this evening, I don't mean just a single instance or a temper tantrum. I mean persistent and cross-situational pattern of self-control. Now, what are the consequences of childhood self-control? We want to move forward now for about 30 years. And in the Dunedin study, we invest a lot of uh, our assessment time on measuring health. When our study participants visit the research unit, we assess their health uh, using a full day of different medical tests and examinations. So, for example, uh, we uh, assess their cardiovascular fitness, as you see here. We assess their cardiovascular health. This is an endothelial function test. Uh, anthropometrics and body fat. Um, blood pressure, an old standby. Uh, there's a respiratory team that assesses their lung and pulmonary function. Uh, and this is every study member's favorite. The last thing at the end of the day is they get to see the dentist. Uh, so they get a complete dental exam every time. And then we draw blood from them at the same time every day, uh, and that we use for laboratory tests, such as sexually transmitted infections or um, uh, uh, inflammation, systemic inflammation. Now, for this talk this evening, I wanted to make one summary measure to summarize each person's health. Uh, so I counted whether the study members had clinically abnormal levels on metabolic abnormalities, and that includes obesity, uh, on periodontal disease, uh, as measured by the dentist, on sexually transmitted infections, on uh, um, systemic inflammation in the blood, as measured by the C-reactive protein, and respiratory dis difficulties, as measured by the respiratory team there. Um, so we just counted up the number of health problems, uh, of health assessments, on which a study member fell into the clinically abnormal range already by the age of 38 years. And this slide jo shows you the first finding. Um, poor childhood self-control was linked to the number of these health problems that each study member had in their late 30s. And I'll just walk you through the slide because you'll see several of these and I want to make sure that, that you understand them. Across the bottom of the slide, you see the cohort of 1,000 children divided into five equally sized groups from low self-control to high self-control. Each of the dark gray bars represents a group containing 200 children. The height of the chart indicates the number of health problems that I just showed you, just a simple count of health problems in the clinical range. What I'd like you to notice is the gradient, the shape of the gradient. The poorer the child's self-control in the first decade of life, the poorer their health at age 38. So I'd like you to keep your eye on this gradient uh, because we're gonna see it over and over and until you get quite bored with it. Uh, but I think it's important and I'll explain why at the end of the talk. Now, one way to think about how self-control is affecting these study members' health as they grow up is to think about the pace of aging. Uh, already in the 30s, there's large individual differences in how rapidly people are aging. These young women are all the same chronological age. Their photographs are taken within 60 days of their 38th birthday. Uh, so whether we consider the health of their bodies, the health of their brains, the health of their faces, some people are aging faster than others. And at this point, I wanted to show you uh, a new project that we've been working on just for the last six months. Um, and this is to use our health biomarkers from the study to track the process of age-related change in each Dunedin study member's life uh, over their 20s and 30s. And we'll continue this into their 40s and 50s in future. Now, the theory that we're using is from gerontology, and that is the concept that aging is a gradual and correlated simultaneous deterioration across all systems of the body. That's kind of 
discouraging, but there's the theory. Um, and the worst, this most discouraging thing is that this deterioration, this gradual, concerted, and, and um, correlated deterioration happens years before you see any age-related disease onset. So you should be able to detect it in people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So I'll show you how we're doing that. Here you see the 18 biomarkers that we've measured repeatedly since 1998 in the course of the study. Uh, and you can see that they are following the gerontology theory, crossing many bodily symptom systems. So we have gum disease, we have telomere length, uh, C-reactive protein, cardiorespiratory fitness, creatinine, uh, BMI, waist hip ratio, uh, blood pressure, uh, the FEV uh, measures of lung pulmonary function, cholesterol, triglycerides, and so forth for the metabolic syndrome, um, and HbA1c for diabetes risk. So 18 different biomarkers that we've been tracking. And this shows you what's happening for the data in the cohort at ages 26, 32, and 38. What you see is a general trend in which the mean levels of each of these biomarkers has been in getting higher over the dozen years that we've been tracking them. And this shows that the Dunedin study members' bodies are aging. Now, in any given individual can show a peak in any given biomarker at any given one age, perhaps just because they have the flu or some other short-term temporary illness. But what you see here is a more general trend for, as the theory of gerontology predicts, it predicts, that all of the bodily systems will be deteriorating together in a correlated way. So we've developed an algorithm that combines the biomarkers to estimate each individual's biological pace of aging. And here I show you the result of that algorithm so far for the five groups of Dunedin study members defined based on their level of self-control as a child in the first decade of life. The middle dashed line across the middle of the slide equals age 38, and so since each person was assessed within 60 days of their 38th birthday, um, you can see how their biomarker profiles for the sample as a norm is. That's at age 38. If you look on the left-hand part of the slide, you see the lowest self-control group is biologically older, older than 38 already. They're almost 39 years old on these biomarkers. If you look on the right, the highest self-control children are staying young. Their mean biological age is about 37. So the two groups are about one and a half years apart, and this uh, difference between them is expected to widen as they continue to age. So now I want to tell you a bit about drug addiction. We interview each of the study members about substance dependence according to DSM-5 or DSM-4 criteria with a clinical psychologist. And for this talk this evening, what I did was simply count up the number of different substances that each of our study members is dependent upon. So they could be dependent upon tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, or other street and prescription drugs. And I'm going to just show you a simple count. Well, here you see the finding. Uh, the red line shows you that the children with poorer self-control said as adults that they were addicted to more different substances uh, than the children who had better self-control. Now, if you look at the blue line, these are reports provided about the study members by people who knew them well. Each study member nominates three people who know them well, and we send out uh, questionnaires to those people. They tend to be partners, uh, friends, roommates, some parents, some co-workers, some siblings. We consult the co the, uh, these informants because we want an independent way to verify findings that are based on self-reports, especially in the event that you might not trust self-reports as might be wise in the matter of addiction to illegal drugs. Uh, but what you see is the blue line and the red line look very similar. So whether we interview the study members about their addiction problems or whether we ask their informants if they have problems with drugs and alcohol, we see the same thing. As adults, children with poor self-control, who are on the left of the slide, had more addiction problems. Now we'll move on to wealth measures. So first I'll show you standard indicators of income 
and the prestige of the study member's occupations. So the children with poor self-control in their late 30s were earning less money than their more self-controlled peers. That's the light blue line. And they also had occupations that were less prestigious and less skilled. That's the dark blue line. Uh, next, I'll talk about financial planfulness for the future. Since the sample is aging and since we all must now save for our own old age, this becomes more important. Um, we interviewed the study members for about a half an hour about their attitudes towards saving and their savings behavior, asking them questions about how important is, is it to you to save for the future? Do you save money by putting it away in each month and not touching it? Uh, do you find yourself living from paycheck to paycheck? Uh, and then we also interviewed them about financial building blocks. Uh, do they already own their own home or apartment? Do they have any investments? Uh, or do they have a retirement plan, things of that nature. That suggests that they are already in their 30s thinking ahead to prepare for their financial future. And this slide shows you that children with less self-control when they reached their late 30s were less oriented towards saving and had accrued fewer assets as building blocks for their financial future. That slide was not supposed to have been there. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'm going to tell you now about credit ratings. Um, the range on credit ratings is um, from 100 to 1,000. I don't know if you have credit rating system in the country where you live, but we do have one in the United States and we have one in New Zealand. Um, what credit ratings do is they keep a track of any kind of bills that you don't pay or any financial uh, uh, impact. Uh, indiscretions that you have, uh, if you have anything that you buy anything on time and then it's uh, repossessed, if you are become bankrupt uh, and you receive a rating um, that is uh, held uh, about you. Uh, so we were able to get the Dunedin study members permission to download their credit ratings from the credit rating company that monitors New Zealand and Australia. And what we found is that um, on this range from 100 to 1,000, um, 700, they tell us, is a good credit rating. Below a credit rating of 700, a person will have difficulty getting credit without clear cl collateral. Uh, this means that you'll have difficulty borrowing money to buy a house or an apartment or to start a business. Uh, but also, it means more than that. Uh, your access to life insurance is priced based on your credit rating. Uh, in the United States, the price of your health insurance and your access to health insurance is priced based on your credit rating. Also, automobile insurance. Even getting a mobile phone contract, they check your credit credit rating first. So we did some research on this in a paper that was published uh, in PNAS last autumn, and what you see here is the study members who had the lowest self-control also had the lowest uh, credit ratings, and that suggests that they're going to have great difficulty uh, with raising capital as they move forward at this stage of life where they want to be buying houses and starting businesses. Now we want to look at their criminal behavior. We um, get study information about study members' court convictions at all the courts in New Zealand and Australia uh, by searching the central commu compu um, police computer uh, of the New Zealand police. And this shows you the percentage of the cohort members in our sample who had been convicted of a crime in criminal court by their late 30s. Uh, the um, convictions don't include traffic offenses, uh, so these are criminal offenses. So as adults, children with poor self-control were more likely to have been convicted by a crime. Now we'll move on to parenting. Uh, we ask if poor childhood self-control also has intergenerational effects. So by their late 30s, about 75% of the Dunedin study members had already become a parent. And when any study member has a first child who reaches the age of three, uh, we carry out a home visit uh, and we, uh, 
what is collected at the home visit is videotapes of parent-child interaction, according to a special paradigm. These videotapes are then sent to a team of experts on parenting who code the videotapes for the study member's warmth toward their toddler, their sensitivity to the child, uh, and the stimulation that they give their child for child development. This work is directed by Jay Belsky, uh, who's here at the conference this week. So if you're interested in, in this part of the data, please talk to Jay. The coders that he uses are kept blind to all other information about the study members. And this slide shows you that the less self-control a study member had in childhood, that this translated directly to less skilled parenting when the study members grew up and had their own child at the age of three. So less self-controlled children turn out as adults to be less warm, less sensitive to their child's needs, and provide a less stimulating environment for their child to develop. And once again, this follows that familiar gradient. So by now, you're probably saying to yourself, just a minute here, I bet the reason that poor self-control seems to make such a big difference in these young people's lives is because children with poor self-control tend to come from poor homes or to have low intelligence, or maybe they're all boys, and they probably have ADHD. That's what I would have thought too. Those are great alternative explanations, but we checked them and they don't explain the facts. The gradients that I have shown you on these slides today were statistically adjusted for social class and for the children's intelligence scores. So this is the point where I lost the $100 wager with the economists. At any rate, the self-control gradient is the same among children from high-income families, children with above-average IQs, uh, it's the same within girls and within boys. All the girls have more self-control than all the boys are over here on self-control, but within sex, the associations between self-control in childhood and adult outcomes remain similar. And we also repeated all the analyses I've shown you today and took out the 61 children from the cohort who had been diagnosed with ADHD as a child, um, and the findings were still the same. So now uh, I want to tell you a little bit about these young people's period of adolescence. We all chuckled when we saw the slide when they were 13 years old, so that's where we're going to go at the moment. So, so far I've emphasized childhood. Um, we also looked at the Dunedin study members' uh, teen years, uh, and this is because it's possible that all these poor adult outcomes uh, happened to low self-control children who made mistakes as a teenager. And if that's true, it would mean that the poor outcomes could be reversed with prevention programs implemented in secondary schools. And that's important because there are already so many prevention programs uh, going on in secondary schools. So what you see here is, yes, the Dunedin children with the lowest self-control did make the most mistakes as teenagers. Uh, they were the most likely to start smoking cigarettes, they were the most likely to drop out of high school, and they were the most likely to have an unplanned baby. So what I'd like you to do now is imagine a utopian world where no teenagers ever smoke, none of them drop out of school, none of them have an unplanned pregnancy. So to see if these kinds of adolescent mistakes accounted for all of the poor adult outcomes, we looked at the Dunedin study members who had this kind of utopian adolescence, the subgroup who did not smoke, did not drop out of school, and did not have a baby. And this is what we found for their health outcomes. The green line on this slide shows you the self-control gradient of health problems that you already saw a few slides back. Um, so this is the simple relationship between self-control and number of health problems at age 38 in the full cohort. The yellow line shows you the same effects on health uh, in the utopian subsample. Now, um, it's interesting because all of these utopian teenagers had fewer health problems as adults. So what that means is the whole gradient was moved downward for them. And I think that's um, important because it hints at what can be achieved with successful interventions in secondary schools. But 
what you also see is that the yellow gradient retains the same shape as the green gradient. And this means that even among those who did not make any mistake as a teenager, or at least not the mistakes we counted, childhood self-control still predicts how many health problems they will develop years later as an adult. This is the same kind of, ex of uh, analysis uh, with using now substituting wealth as the outcome, and you see the same result. All of these utopian teenagers had higher incomes as adults, so the entire gradient for income was moved upwards for them. But it's still the same gradient shape, and that means that even among those who did not make mistakes as teenagers, childhood self-control was still important for how much money they would be able to earn years later as adults. At this point, we want to do a little work to isolate whether self-control is the active ingredient. I'm still clinging on to IQ and wanting to win back my $100, so I'm trying to push this in another sample. In the Dunedin study, we use statistical controls for family income in order to show that a child's self-control was important beyond his or her family income. But, you know, as you know, there's a lot more to family life than just uh, money. So uh, we wanted another way to isolate self-control as the active ingredient. So let's look within one family. What you can do is compare two siblings. Sibling one, there at the top, the one with the poorer self-control, shown running around, uh, who is in theoretically at risk for uh, poorer later outcomes. Uh, as compared to the other sibling, who has relatively better self-control and is very sweetly reading a book, uh, shown on the bottom line, and the question is, would these two children have different outcomes even though they grow up in the same home with the same parents? So this question gives me an opportunity to tell you about our other newer longitudinal study. So we must leave New Zealand now and travel back to the Northern Hemisphere to Britain. So in the 1990s, uh, we moved to England and we began a new longitudinal study. We're using the same general model as the Dunedin study, but this time following a sample of twins. Uh, we enrolled a national sample of twins born in the UK, uh, and here, oh, sorry, here you see them on their first day of school in 1999. Um, and there are workers from that study who are here. Tim Matthews is a PhD student in particular, so if, Tim, if you're there, you might raise your hand. Uh, so he's been working very hard on this study this year. So it's called the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Study. Um, the, it's 1994-95 birth cohort, 2,232 twins growing up in 1,100 and some families. It's nationally representative of the UK. We oversampled twins born to teenage mothers to get twins growing up in social disadvantage, and we undersampled twins born to older mothers who used um, uh, uh, artificial reproduction, assist, assisted reproduction, in order to avoid having a twin sample uh, with, that was um, raised by older, more educated mothers. Um, half of the twins are dizygotic, half are monozygotic. Uh, we followed them up at birth, age 5, age 7, age 10, age 12, and just finished seeing them in December at age 18 years, and 93% of the twins took part as 18-year-olds. So kudos to the London team for pulling that off. So now we want to uh, measure their self-control. At age five, we used the same kind of measurement approach as I had shown you in the Dunedin study. Uh, we have parent measures, we have the research worker who does the home visit does measures, and the teacher does measures of this kind of um, uh, evidence of uh, variation in self-control. I should also pause to tell you that the monozygotic twins are more alike on self-control than the dizygotic twins, so there is evidence of this study, uh, from this study of genetic influence. So now we fast forward to their adolescence. What we did was we compared just using the dizygotic twins so that we could get twins who are very different from each other on self-control. We compared these dizygotic twins within each pair on problems when they reached adolescence. We chose to count school failure because it's our best predictor of adult wealth. 
we chose to uh, count smoking because it's our best predictor in adolescence of adult health. And we chose to count juvenile delinquency because it's our best adolescent predictor of adult criminal convictions. And on average, in this simple depiction, uh, we see the twin with the lower self-control at age five had more of these kinds of problems in secondary school. And that's shown with the left bar. Uh, and this is despite having grown up in the same home with the same parents in the same neighborhood, in the same school, and in most cases in the same classroom. We also added statistical, con statistical controls here for any differences between the two twins in birth weight or in their IQ scores. So from this analysis, we learn it's not merely the family into which you're born that matters. It's whether you're able to develop self-control skills uh, that counts as well. Next, we wanted to look at the cost to society. Uh, I've shown you that self-control affects the lives of individuals. We also wanted to evaluate the importance of childhood self-control for an individual's nation. What's the cost of poor self-control to everybody? So we looked at the cost of self-control in schools and classrooms. And when the Iris twins were 12-year-olds, we asked their teachers, how much effort does it take you to have your, this child in your classroom? We said uh, on the questionnaires, compared to their classmates, how often must you keep this child's attention on task? How often must you act to curb disruptive behavior by this child? How often does this child's behavior make it frustrating to work with him and her in the classroom? How often does this child need one-to-one -one interaction from you? How often must you give this child extra encouragement to get him or her to take part? Interestingly, when we were looking for a measure of teacher effort, we couldn't find one in the educational literature or the developmental psychology literature. So this is not a, um, uh, an established, standardized, fully normed measure of teacher effort. My mother is a teacher, and I just asked her to make a list for me of the things that got up her nose in the classroom. And so this is Mrs. Moffat's pretty good measure of teacher effort. Um, so here you see our old familiar gradient. The less self-control the child had at age five, the more effort the teacher said she had to use to control that child seven years later when they entered secondary school. The data points are adjusted for the child's IQ and the family's social class. The pupils with low self-control take teacher's effort and energy away from teaching other pupils in the classroom. Um, this suggests that low self-control children may have a knock-on effect of reducing teachers' job satisfaction, increasing teacher turnover, losing teachers from the workforce, uh, and that means that it has potentially uh, important cost to our education system. Now I want to show you economic measures of the cost of low self-control to government. And to answer this question, now we return to New Zealand. Uh, we collaborated with the New Zealand government in order to look at records of social welfare benefits that have been used by our study members over the years. We learned three things from doing this. First, almost half of our study members in Dunedin had received some social welfare benefits between the age of 21 and 38. That's a lot of people, but New Zealand has a generous social welfare system and people use it. Next, we, what we see is that childhood self-control, although childhood self-control did not predict whether someone needed a government benefit, uh, what it did predict is how long adults stayed on government benefits. So we have their social welfare benefits month by month, and we see that on average, Dunedin children with the poorest self-control were likely to be supported by government social welfare benefits for around four to six years. Those with the best self-control, if they needed a hand handout, a helping handout from government, uh, were able to get off of the benefits within the year.
So clearly, the cost of poor self-control to the New Zealand taxpayer is not trivial, and the cost uh, is even greater to political attitudes. So we know from surveys that most taxpayers want their country to have a safety net, but what they do not want is for social welfare recipients to become dependent upon welfare benefits and stay on them for many years. This kind of thing undermines public support for the social welfare system. But are they happy? So I'm often asked, uh, isn't it the case that the children in the Dunedin study who had the most extreme high self-control all have obsessive compulsive disorder? Are they all OCD kids? So that would suggest a bad thing. If it were possible to increase self-control in the population, we might be creating a future of humorless robots who lack creativity and spontaneity and are, are, and are incapable of personal happiness. Uh, so this frightened me a little bit. Um, and I, uh, as a result, we interviewed the Dunedin study members uh, recently about their satisfaction with their lives. This slide shows you that most people in their 30s in New Zealand say that they are satisfied with their lives. About 70% of them are fully satisfied. But the most satisfied of all are those on the right, those who begin life as a child with high self-control. Now, we looked at creativity also, and I don't have a slide to show you, unfortunately, but we interviewed the Dunedin study members about their talents and their achievements um, in quite an extensive interview. What we found is that self-control is not related to whether a study member <coughs> plays music or dances or writes poems or books or plays or does visual art or starts a business as an entrepreneur uh, it's not related to whether they enter politics or become a scientist or play competitive sports. Self-control did not explain who engaged in achievements. But what self-control predicted is whether they have had publicly acclaimed success in these endeavors, whether their novel has been published, whether their, uh, our their music has been recorded and sold, whether their artworks have been sold in a gallery, whether their play has been performed by a theatrical troupe, whether they've gotten a grant for their science or gotten their article published in a journal, whether they hold elective, elected office, and whether they play on New Zealand's Olympic team. So, it's not creativity per se that's related to uh, self-control, but it seems to be the self-discipline that converts creativity into a product. So that's what we're finding in relation um, to creativity. So what are the implications of all this? You've seen already that self-control in early childhood predicts many important outcomes. If it were possible to improve self-control skills, doing this might lower costs to government and taxpayers of crime control, healthcare delivery, and social welfare benefits, and even education. Children who begin their life by learning better self-control should end their lives healthier and better prepared financially for retirement and old age. And this would reduce uh, dependency in old age and improve quality of longer lives. What about for the next generation of children? We saw that the study members with low self-control were less warm, less sensitive to their own three-year-old child. We also saw that they were likely to have low incomes, to be struggling financially, to have poor physical health, to have a criminal record, and to be substance abusers. This is not the ideal parenting situation for rearing the next generation of children. So when to intervene, childhood or adolescence? There's a great deal of debate about this in the literature, especially in the economic literature. When do you get the best return on investment? Uh, we showed you that preventing adolescents from making mistakes might be one window of opportunity. If we could prevent them from starting smoking, dropping out of school, and getting pregnant, uh, that would go a long way. But we also saw that it would get us only about half the way there, and that su suggests that earlier intervention is going to be important too. 
So if you remember that gradient, I said I would mention why I think it's important. When we published the gradient first in 2011, many people found it surprising. It's gotten a lot of attention from academics and from researchers and policymakers. Most people, including me, when I first made this wager, uh, would have thought that there are a few children who lack self-control and that maybe these children are just the small number who have uh, diagnosable uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or a disorder of impulse control, such as conduct disorder, and that these few children need targeted individual treatment by a trained mental health professional. But our findings suggest something different, and they're persuading me, although I'm a trained mental health professional, that I might be out of a job. Um, so I think that you've got to ask yourself, would targeted intervention for a few do the trick, or do we need to consider universal interventions for all? I showed you that even children who are above average on self-control could benefit from better self-control skills. The gradient was there for them. Even intelligent children from well-to-do homes could benefit from better self-control skills. The gradient looked the same for them. The gradient usually is taken to imply the advantages of universal enhancement. And universal programs are also politically popular because taxpayers don't mind paying for them if everyone's child is going to benefit. So what should we say about a universal intervention? Um, uh, there are lots of different ways to think about this, uh, and I just want to give you one example. Uh, and this is from Sesame Street Children's Television. Um, and it's a program called For Me, For You, and For Later. And in this program, the puppets Elmo and Grover and Cookie Monster show children how to save money and how to delay gratification. They show them how to think ahead to the future to get something you really, really want by waiting. So the puppets identify a toy that they really, really want, and they understand that they need money to buy it, and so they start taking on little tasks and chores, such as raking leaves or watering plants for the adults on the Sesame Street show. The adults give each of them three pennies each time they do a, a, a chore, and they put the pennies, one in the glass in the jar for me, one in the jar for you, that's for charity, and one in the jar for later, that's for teaching self-control. Um, the website is shown there. They disseminate materials for parents and teachers to reinforce the contents of the television program at home. And they tell me, the Sesame Street designers, that uh, the program is based on the principle that money is the strongest motivator for learning, and saving money is the best way to teach self-control, even for preschool children. So how should we think about universal intervention? Um, to understand it, I like to think about our recent history. Modern countries like the Netherlands entered the 20th century with a huge education gap. Only an elite few went to university, and most people only had eight years of schooling. Many citizens didn't know how to read at all. Teaching literacy to the whole population became a societal goal for the early years of the 1900s in the countries that are developed today, and it was a huge success. It changed the quality of life and increased prosperity for entire nations. Today we have another, newer factor in early life that seems to influence life success for children. Most everybody learns to read now. That pro program has succeeded. But as I showed you at the beginning of this talk, self-control has come to mean more today than it did in the past, and a person's level of health and wealth now follow, in part, from the self-control skills they're able to master as children. The gradient that I showed you means that teaching better self-control skills to the whole population of children and expecting better self-control as a cultural adaptation might become an interesting societal goal for this century. All this brings us an opportunity to initiate a civic dialogue about the kind of society we want in the future and for tomorrow's children. I hope this lecture will stimulate the audience to think about what future you want for children growing up in your home country.